Thank you very much for coming. Um, I am Ray Brown, and you guys do have my bio, and so I guess I don't even need to in introduce myself. Uh, I've been involved with the Buffalo Soldiers for quite some time now, uh, but it actually started when I was a young lieutenant in the United States Army. My first duty assignment was at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, and it was a, an awesome experience because uh, when I checked on the post, uh, the gentleman at the uh, duty desk said, you know, you ought to go across the parade field and take a look at this museum. And I said, oh, okay. So I walk into this museum and I see all these black faces on the wall in military uniform. I say, who the heck are those guys? I had no idea who they were. Uh, so I, I got interested in learning about the Buffalo Soldiers and, and then my interest uh, kind of expanded. And it expanded here in Pueblo when I uh, started working at the Air Museum. And, uh, we would uh, talk to kids and, and adults as they come into the Air Museum and they were interested in learning about the Tuskegee Airmen. And so uh, Ruth Steele, who I worked with, uh, she would tell everybody the stories of the Tuskegee Airmen. And a lot of the people kind of looked like, oh, okay, that's normal. You know, it's not a big deal. These guys were, were Tuskegee Airmen and that's cool. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, they really don't understand the struggle. They don't understand anything about how much work and how much trouble these guys had to go through in order to become Tuskegee Airmen. So, so I thought, well, maybe I ought to expand my, my presentation. So I started talking about the Buffalo Soldiers, and that just wasn't enough either. So I said, well, you know, maybe I need to go back and, uh, and talk about a little bit more and give them a little bit of help. So I'm going to give you a presentation tonight because I think Pueblo has a uh, distinct um, history here and there's been just a tr tremendously diverse number of people that have come and gone out of Pueblo and, and we should talk a little bit about them. So my presentation, I'm going to start with a little song just to, just to get, it, get things rolling and we'll see if that will work. Everyone knows the history of uh, James Beckworth and the fact that he came to Pueblo and, and actually may have been one of the people that is responsible for founding the uh, city of Pueblo. People came here to Pueblo to be a part of the steel mill. There were a lot of support men and women. They were barbers, laborers, construction workers. They made their homes all throughout the city of Pueblo. The Lincoln Orphanage was started around the uh, 1900s is the only African-American orphanage west of the Mississippi River at the time. We're going to go ahead and stop that for a second. What I wanted to do is uh, briefly talk about the formation of the Union Colored Soldiers during the Civil War. The formation of the colored men into individual state militia organizations started in May of 1862. The War Department officially began the formation of units in May of 1863. It was clear that in that period that black men had to become a part of the Civil War and the struggle for freedom. President Lincoln was not supportive of the use of African Americans at initially. It was thought to be too radical of an idea. But in 1863, Union losses had grown to such a high level 
that there was a need for that manpower. Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists pressed their case to President Lincoln. Something I didn't know anything about until I actually started doing a study of African American men in the military was that there were actually 163 regiments that were formed during the, during the course of the Civil War, serving in just the Union Army. There were 186,000 men that fought in the infantry, cavalry, the light and heavy artillery. 33,380 of those men lost their lives. Another interesting fact was that there were over 7,122 officers that served in the U.S. colored troops. An interesting fact was is that there were 120 African American officers. They were, they were ranked from lieutenant all the way through to lieutenant colonel. These officers were line officers, they were chaplains, they were doctors. African American women made a contribution as laborers, guides, nurses, and even spies. I mentioned that there were men of color from other different countries. Over 80 different countries had uh, men and women that came to the United States during that time frame. Over 20,000 men and women of color served in the Union Navy, aboard 600 ships. In fact, over 25% of the Navy during the Civil War was minorities. The jobs in the Navy were kind of interesting because what they did was they said, well, we can't put together any segregated ships, so what we'll do is we'll just integrate and if you're qualified for a job, you get a job. Isn't that novel? <laughs> Something that again kind of interesting to me was that there were black Confederate soldiers. 65,000 African Americans from the South served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. More than 13,000 African Americans were in direct fighting roles. Now, the Southerners weren't all that keen on having a lot of African Americans running around with guns, but, but they did do that. And there were very loyal subjects that uh, took part in that. In 1865, the Confederates decided that they were going to bring in another 300,000 African Americans to fight in the war. Their plan was hatched a little bit too late and they never got it done. So we, uh, we got a call from this uh, young lady, her name was Lucille Corsentino, uh, Miss Steele and I. And Miss uh, Corsentino says to us, there's Buffalo soldiers buried in Roselawn. And I said, oh my gosh, that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, so so we, uh, we notified the troops and, and we uh, decided to go out and, and find these Buffalo soldiers that were buried there. But so I came up with uh, an initial goal and I set that goal and I said, I want to know who these people are. I wanted to know where they came from. I wanted to know how and why did they get to Pueblo. Why would these guys come to Pueblo, Colorado? I wanted to determine if any of these soldiers were in fact Buffalo soldiers, and that's where we started. So the place that we actually started was right here. And this is actually my, my little booklet, so I was taking notes on it, so don't read all my little notes, but, but it's the historical guide from Rose Lawn, and more importantly, on the inside cover, they talked about the Civil War section of their cemetery. And down at the bottom, and you, can, you can see it down here, there's actually 
a little list of six African-American names that, of guys that were veterans of the Civil War and buried in Pueblo. And that's where we started. And just because you can't read it in that piece of paper, I, I thought I'd bring them out for you. So we had guys like George Washington, David Smith, Andrew Jackson Smith, Thomas Walker, Preston B. Harris, and Samuel A. Dean. So this is our crew. This is the, the initial group of people that came out to uh, discover these, these gentlemen and try to figure out who they were. Notice that there were a couple of Buffalo soldiers uh, from the motorcycle group in Colorado Springs. They were also interested. So we walked around Roselawn and, and I took pictures, so I'm not in any of the photos, but uh, we took pictures of people. There's David Smith. Now, the one thing I wanted you to note is uh, the unit. And this was kind of baffling to us because we didn't know quite what that stood for. We were guessing a little bit and we said, well, I bet you that's United States. And then uh, I think we came up with colored infantry. Okay. So that was kind of interesting. There's Preston Harris. He was a sergeant in the 47th United States Colored Infantry. So we wandered around and they had uh, marked a grave that uh, didn't have a marker there, so we thought we'd look a little closer at it. Oh my gosh, there's George Washington. So we started uh, with that bit of information, and with that information, I came to the library. And that's where Charlene and I uh, kind of visited a little bit, and she says to me, I've got some books you might be interested in looking at. And I said, great. So she pulls out the Civil War veterans buried in Pueblo, Colorado. And I thought, wow, OK. So those are the books that we used. And they're available in the uh, genealogy section of the library. You can't take them home, but you can look at them. So this is uh, one of the pages. And each one of the pages has two different cards on, each, on the page. This, this card says that this belongs to James Williams. And he's got a middle initial of W. The, the one thing that I wanted to make note of, uh, and I really wasn't, that, I wasn't paying close attention when I first started, is there's no marker for this man. Uh, it tells me what his home address is, uh, what caused his death, and in fact, this man here was burned to death at his home of a fire. Uh, it tells me the location of where he is buried in the cemetery. Oh, and also the cemetery. It gives me information about his birth. He was born in 1844, and he was born in Virginia. In November 26, eight, or 1921, he died. When you're starting to look at this, you say, well, you know, there's some information I wanted to know. But one thing that I wanted to know is did he participate in the Civil War? And all of these guys, in fact, did participate in the Civil War. And it tells me what unit he participated in. And in the case of uh, James Williams, he was a soldier in the 55th Massachusetts. Now, if any of you guys saw the movie Glory, they talked about the 54th Massachusetts. The 55th was formed almost immediately after the 54th was formed. And they formed them because they had so many volunteers that they filled the ranks of the 54th. And so the 55th was then formed. Does that help? OK. Now, I did this for each and every one of the soldiers that are buried there. This is the, on the same page. Uh, this is another card, and basically it's a reiteration of the same information in a lot of cases. 
but uh, I could gleam some additional information off of the card. So let's see, we're at a point now where we can talk about, oh, okay, James Dean, Preston B. Harris, uh-oh, Andrew J. Smith, he's in red. There's a reason for that. He's a white officer, okay? And I'll, I have to tell you, I spent a lot of time trying to find information about Andrew J. Smith um, because there were probably 10 of them <laughs> that I ran across in the, in the Civil War. And one of them happens to be an African American who earned the Medal of Honor. And I thought, whoa, man, can you believe this? We got a Medal of Honor guy? And, oh, it's not him. Okay, so, so it happens to be an officer, Andrew Jack, Jackson Smith. And by the way, Jackson is the middle name for all of those guys too. David Smith was good. So that's three out of the four that we uh, found that came out of the book. Thomas Walker was also good, but he didn't have a marker. George Washington didn't have a marker. And then we found another guy. Uh, in looking through those two books that I showed you, James W. Williams was also listed as an African American who fought in the Civil War in a unit, and I'll tell you more about him as we go along, but he also didn't have a marker. I thought I'd uh, take a, a, a brief moment and just talk about some of the things that the white officers did in order to become officers in these colored units. Uh, this happens to be the uh, discharge document from the Army. So most of these guys, well actually all of these guys, served in the United States Army in a all-white unit and at some point in time they decided that they wanted to, to make a departure and become an officer in the Army. So they were discharged from the army as a corporal or a private in some cases, and then they, were, they accepted a commission. And that's an official uh, commission document. And you can see that it's from the Bureau of Colored Troops. And this happens to be a, a document for another man, but, but it, you get the gist. So, let's talk about the officers who served in the colored troops that are buried in Roselawn Cemetery. We talked about Andrew Jackson Smith, who's a lieutenant, and he's buried there. There's another man, Harmon T. Chappell, and there's two L's on the end of his name, but when I was looking him up on the computer, uh, there were lots of indi indications that uh, there was only one, in, one L at the end of his name. There's George Hobson, Jefferson McCarty, and Lewis Young. And we've, when we found Lewis Young, it was quite interesting because he also doesn't have a marker at that time. Was that the end of my research? Nah, I didn't stop there. Um, all that did was that start, uh, struck a fire with me and I said, you know what? If there's all these African Americans that fought in the Civil War in Roselawn, maybe there's some in some of the other cemeteries in town. So I started looking around. And I went back to my books and started searching again outside of Roselawn, and I found some more guys. So how about I just give you a brief summary of, of what I found? I looked all the way from the Indian Wars. I also looked into the Spanish-American War and I went to World War I. Now, you might, you might be curious, why did I go all the way up to World War I? It was pretty easy because they were still in segregated units and they were identifiable. So after World War I, it got a little more difficult to identify all the different units of all the different soldiers, so I stopped looking at the end of World War I. But the Indian Wars were those Buffalo soldiers. Those were guys that were in the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry, and also the 24th and 25th Infantries. The Spanish-American War, those again were the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry and 24th and 25th Infantry. And World War I, those were your 92nd and 93rd Divisions. 
the Buffalo Soldiers did not go to World War I. So how about in Pueblo? Are there any officers and uh, soldiers that served in African American units? Well, they were in all three of our, our old uh, cemeteries, Roselawn, Mountain View, and also Pioneer. There were five Civil War officers that fought with the African Americans and six soldiers at Roselawn. At Mountain View, there was one Civil War officer and two Civil War soldiers. There were also two Indian War or Spanish-American War soldiers. Those are the Buffalo soldiers. And there were also seven World War I soldiers that are buried in Mountain View. In Pioneer Cemetery, there's two Civil War soldiers. So we're going to focus on Rose Lawn. Isn't that a nice picture? I'm still not sure what that other flag is, but. So let's take a look at each one of these guys a little bit more closely. This is Andrew Jackson Smith. Remember, there's a lot of them, so it took me quite a while to figure this out. So let me just tell you a little bit about him. He was born around 1836 in Somerset, Maine. He enlisted on, in September of 1862 in Lawrence, Kansas, into the 12th Kansas Volunteer Infantry. And he was a private at the time that he volunteered. They transferred him to E Company, 12th Kansas Infantry, colored on the 2nd of May of 1863. And then his unit was renamed the 79th Regiment, U.S. Colored Infantry. Now, I didn't go through and give you the detail of all the things that they did while they were there, but, but you'll get a gist. So he fought with these guys and mustered out of the service in October of 1865. Now, in 1870, let's see, 1878, he moved with his family to Colorado Springs. And then shortly after that, he moved to Pueblo. He passed away on 12 October 1905 at 68 years old in his residence at 919 East 2nd Street. Now there was an obituary that I located and the obituary says that he was one, he was known as one of the pioneers of the city of Pueblo. It's quite interesting, I thought, wow. His son Ernest F. Smith was an inspector at the Colorado Telegraph Company, or Telephone Company, excuse me. Lieutenant Hammond T. Chappell. He was born in 1840 in Ohio. He enlisted into Battery B, the 1st Illinois Light Artillery, and he did that on 16 July 1861. He re-enlisted as a veteran, so he left the military and re-enlisted as a veteran in January of 1864. He was promoted to corporal, and on 10 March 1864, he accepted a commission as a second lieutenant. On 28 July 1864, he was promoted to first lieutenant, and he commanded Battery E, 2nd U.S. Colored Light Artillery. He mustered out of the Army on 25 September 1865, and he died in Pueblo on April the 8th, 1905. I just found Jefferson McCarty a couple of weeks ago. He was a first lieutenant, but he was born in 1836, excuse me, in 1850, he was 14 years old and living with his parents in Warren, Ohio. On December 1st, 1863, he enlisted in Company F, 128th Ohio Infantry Regiment as a corporal and was promoted to a full sergeant. On April 15th, 1864, he mustered out to accept a commission and on 22nd of June, 1864, he was 
assigned to Company G, 107th Infantry Regiment. He was promoted to First Lieutenant on June 22, 1865, and he married Sarah Watts from England that year. In 1870, the census showed that uh, the McCarty family was living in Salina, Kansas, along with his wife and two children, his father and brother, -in or his, his wife's father and brother-in-law, William Watts Jr. and William Watts. Jefferson uh, worked as a carpenter, and in 1880, the census showed that the family was living in the Dakota Territory. 1890, the census says the family was living in Pueblo. Jefferson passed away of natural causes on January 5, 1902, and was buried in the Pioneer Cemetery, and his body was moved to Roselawn on the 22nd of August, 1904, by his wife. I wonder why she moved him. <laughs> okay, we have uh, George Hobson. He was born in Henry County, Indiana on May 29th, 1842. He was raised and educated in Missouri and enlisted in 1861. He enlisted into Company H, 35th Missouri Infantry Regiment, as a private. On 10 August 1862, he was mustered out and accepted a commission. He stayed a second lieutenant and was assigned to Company G, 60th United States Colored Infantry and mustered out of service in 1865. George Hobson became a resident of Pueblo in 1869. Now this guy's kind of interesting. Check this out. He was a stockholder, director. He was a vice president and president of the Stock Growers National Bank until it consolidated with the American National Bank. Mr. Hobson died in his home on 3rd and Summit on October the 2nd, 1900. He left a large estate of cattle, mines, and that's mines where they dig things, uh, personal property, and real estate. He was married and had no children. This is Lieutenant Lewis Young. Now, remember, he didn't have a marker, so that comes later. So scratch the marker, it's not there. Our reports, our reports show that Lewis Young was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, now, if you listen to the uh, NPR uh, uh, piece that they did on, on our ceremony, uh, there was some controversy as to whether or not that was true. Uh, the guy that, uh, that looked at it said he thought he was born in Europe. Well, his records say he was born in, in Vicksburg, Mississippi. He uh, enlisted into Company C, 1st Battalion Engineers and Missouri Volunteers. And on 26 December 1863, he was commissioned as a first lieutenant in Company F, 66th Regiment, United States Colored Infantry. He served as the company quartermaster. Those are the guys that deal with supplies, right? On uh, 20, uh, 20 May 1866, Young was mustered out of the service. He married Louisa Pate of New Orleans and uh, this is another one of those kind of interesting things. They had three kids, and they were all boys, but uh, in 1885, Louisa, she filed uh, his pension and said he was dead. Okay? I don't know about you guys, but I thought that was a little strange, especially since he appears in Pueblo <laughs> a little bit later. Um, so he's a resident of Pueblo in 1893 and lives at 53 Mechanics Building. Our records indicate that Lewis Young was a molder. I'm not sure what a molder is. Anybody know what a molder is? Something in the steel mill, I think. Because he worked for Colorado Fence and Iron Works. And he actually died here in Pueblo on April 27th, 1900. So he was buried at Roselawn in an unmarked grave. And if you want to, if you want to know what I think, is that the government, when they found out that he was buried a second time, kind of decided, well, we're not giving this guy a second uh, marker, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, he didn't get a marker. Uh, 
Okay, so now we, we've done all the officers, so let's quickly go through the uh, enlisted folks. So the enlisted guys, Private David Smith is the first one. He was born a slave in Louisiana around 1842. He enlisted into the service in 1863 and was assigned to Company C, 14th Regiment of the United States Colored Infantry, which is uh, organized in Tennessee. Uh, in 1863, he was 21 years old and uh, stood five foot seven and a quarter. See, isn't that cool what I could do? I, I find information, it's like, wow, this is cool. I know how tall he was. Uh, his complexion was brown. He had brown eyes and black hair. The regiment marched to the relief of Dalton, Georgia, uh, was at the siege of Decatur, Alabama, fought in the battles of Nashville, served at Chattanooga, in the district of Eastern Tennessee before being mustered out of Green, in Greenville. So he was mustered out in 1866. He was married and had two children. Um, he was a servant working with Joel H. Wheeler, who was a stock owner in Denver, Colorado in the 1880s. In the 1900s, David Smith was in Pueblo, Colorado. In 1897, the Pueblo City Directory shows that he was in lab, and I'm not sure again what that really means, but lab at the steelworks, and was living at uh, 423 Spring Street in Pueblo. He died on July 25th, 1913 with stomach cancer. Pri Private Sam L. Dean. This guy's kind of interesting too. He was born a slave in Kentucky around 1836. And along with Adam Dean, a mulatto, who was 25, and Isaac Dean, a mulatto, who was 28, Sam L., who was in fact 30, was listed as black. He was drafted into the service by his owner, John Dean. So notice, now we're talking draft, right? <laughs> and it's like, what, they had a draft back in there? Of course they did. That's what my daughter told me anyway. Of course they did. <laughs> so um, they actually were drafted into the service. So let's see what happens after he gets drafted. He's a guard and uh, is in Louisville, Kentucky until 1867. Um, he, he was mustered out of the service and married Louisa, another Louisa, I hope. And in 1880, census shows Dean in Gunnison, Colorado. And at the same time, Louisa, his wife, is here in Pueblo. She's self-employed as a housekeeper. He was living at 2021 Summit Avenue in Pueblo at the time of his death on January 4th, 1909. Sergeant Preston Harris, Company B, 47th United States Colored Infantry. He was born in Mississippi in 1848. He enlisted as a private in 1864 and joined Company B, 67th United States Colored Infantry when it was organized. Now these guys had a, had a real tough time there uh, from, let's see, this, this one I got too much detail, so I'm not gonna go through all the detail on it, but he served in, uh, in the Yanzu River, um, went to Mechanicsburg, uh, was on the White River, and did duty in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Preston Harris was a resident of Pueblo in 1904 and lived at 20 or 1228 East Route Avenue. The uh, city directory says that he was a janitor. In 1809, at the age of 60, he passed away with tuberculosis and was buried at Rose Lawn Cemetery. Thomas Walker. And this one I talked a little bit about, uh, let's see. More than 1,000 black recruits left their masters for recruiting offices on November 23rd, 1863 through January 7th, 1864. The former owners were compensated up to $300 for their losses. At the same time, white officers were transferring to uh, come and work with these guys. Uh, but when they were formed, they formed two regiments, the 62nd and 65th 
U.S. Colored Infantries, and they were mustered into service at Benton Barracks in St. Louis on a very cold December of 1863. More than 100 soldiers died in their first two months of service from exposure and disease. And that's because these guys were sent to Benton Barracks without shoes, hats, or anything else. They had very little food provisions. The 62nd lost 400 men, and the 65th lost 749 men to non-combat causes. Corporal Walker, who was born about 1845, was a member of Company I, 65th Regiment. He enlisted in 1863 and was discharged in 1867. He survived the war, or the war and came to Pueblo in 1880. He married Adeline, and she was from Tennessee. He was a porter at the Antlers Saloon and lived on the 11th and Summit. He died of pneumonia in November of 1900. He was buried at Roselawn. He also had a government marker. Uh, but when we found him, we didn't know that his marker had actually fall, fallen over and was, was buried under the soil. Uh, and so until we actually had a replacement marker for him, we didn't know that the marker was physically there. George Washington, we're almost done with these guys. Uh, George Washington was uh, born in 1838, somewhere in Tennessee. He joined the Union Army on uh, June 8, 1863, and was assigned to Company K, 55th Massachusetts Volunteer as a private. So they did all kinds of things in the 55th. He was a part of Wilde's uh, brigade, and uh, the unit did uh, pretty well. Let's see, he married a, a woman after he left the service in 1880. He married Juanita, who was described as a Mexican woman, and the couple lived in Trinidad, Colorado. They had two children, Joe and Cristona, and uh, they moved to Pueblo in 1891. He's listed as a barber in the city directory and lives uh, on 6th Street, East 6th, if you will. They moved to Plum Street, and he passed away and was buried without a marker. James Williams was born in 1844, somewhere in Virginia. James was a laborer and lived in Leesburg, Ohio. And when he was 19, he joined the Union Army in 1863. He was assigned to Company K, 55th Massachusetts. And he actually mustered out of the service the same day as uh, the gentleman before him. So James William lives in Pueblo at 1893, and according to the city directory, he was a turf exchange dealer, and then he was employed as a cook. He died in a home fire, as, a, as we saw in the card before, at his home in 1921. So, these guys without markers uh, was a, a real challenge for us because what we needed to do then was um, work through the Veterans Administration to see if we could actually get markers for these soldiers that didn't have them. Uh, what you see there is a sheet for Thomas Walker. And uh, uh, basically, once you get the form, you fill it out. And along with their pension records and proof that they were actually served in the military, then you can apply for a marker for a person that doesn't have a marker. If he's related to you, if you're a direct relative of his, you can get a marker. If you're not a direct relative, uh, which is the case with me and all four of these gentlemen that were buried, uh, what I had to do was, was I uh, said, well, hmm, I'm not a blood relative, but if I go down and ask the city manager, uh, maybe Maybe he can say that I have the authority to request the uh, markers. And that wasn't the case. The, the government kind of looked at me and said, sorry, buddy. <laughs> You're not related to these guys. You don't get a marker. Uh, so uh, Lucille and, uh, and Kevin McCarthy, along with me, they, we kind of come up with a plan. And Kevin said he had some markers that uh, were blank, and we could actually use those uh, at Roselawn. And, Based on that fact, 
uh, we went ahead and proceeded. So, so we didn't get the markers from the government because the government is not authorized to release markers to anyone other than family members. Now that's something that can be changed, but it has to be changed through Congress. So if you guys know, know any congressmen that, uh, that uh, can maybe ease that, that regulation, because some of these guys have been buried for 100, 150 years, and you know their families may just not be around. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I haven't found one yet. So uh, if, if it's possible, uh, we need to get Congress to rethink that and say, you know, if there's a guy that we can prove that was a, a, a veteran of a military war and doesn't have a marker and is authorized to have one, then we should be able to get it. And I, I hope you guys agree with me on that. Oh, well, there's my horse. There's my trusty steed. That's Gus. And Gus is there as a part of our ceremony to honor those four veterans that didn't have markers. Uh, Gus is there um, to honor those fallen heroes. And so he's got uh, the boots strapped in to the stirrups backwards. And that's, uh, that's what they do for, for those types of ceremonies. Uh, but in uh, October 3rd last year, we had a ceremony at Roselawn to honor those four unmarked uh, graves and so we had Gus there. We also had DOS Aviation and they did a flyover, which was very beautiful. We were able to bring down a group from north of Denver, north and uh, east of Denver, uh, the 79th Highlanders. They brought their color guard. We had their pipes and drums. and the Buffalo Soldiers of American West. Now these gentlemen uh, all live in the North Denver area or Brighton uh, in that area of Colorado. And they came down to, uh, to help us celebrate uh, these gentlemen. We had a guest speaker, a retired Sergeant Major, R. Kenneth O'Neill. We had Sergeant Major retired Chris Robles help us out with the part of the ceremony. And I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Lucille for, for starting this. So Lucille, thank you. Raise your hand, let everybody know who you are. Thank you very much for all your efforts. <laughs> Without you, I can tell you this wouldn't have happened. So I appreciate everything you did. Uh, we also want to thank Kevin McCarthy and Roselawn Cemetery because every step along the way, uh, both Lucille and Kevin helped me and supported me with encouragement to, uh, to get this all done and, and actually get markers for those four gentlemen. There's special thanks also to uh, the Rawlings Library, genealogy staff, DOS Aviation, the Buffalo Soldiers of the American West, 79th Highlanders, Living History Association, Buffalo Soldier Motorcycle Club of Colorado Springs, the Young Marines, who helped us with the ceremony, Boy Scouts of America, R. Kenneth O'Neill, Chris Robles, Reverend Orville Miles, Kennedy and Patty Pugh, uh, Wayne Farley, who was our, our bugler, uh, Kathy Bassino, thank you very much. Uh, we also couldn't have done the ceremony without your assistance, so we really appreciate that. So to end my presentation, I have a treat. population today, ratio-wise, 
that would equate to approximately six and a half million people. These brave souls matter because they help define the meaning of freedom, citizenship, and equality. Corporal Thomas Walker, we don't know where he was born. He served from 1863, January 1867 with Company I, 65th, and Company H, 67 U.S. Colored Infantry. Corporal Walker died on November 15, 1900, from Colorado. Thank you very much.